What was that? Did I say that? Apparently. Apparently so. WTF. I love that. Okay. I love that program. It's just so, so much fun. Moving on. So, I mean, I just want to go over some of the muscles. And I don't even recall. And I wonder if I forgot. Did I, did I not send you a recording from the last time we were here with the introduction of muscles? I don't There wasn't too much on it. I'll have to look. Uh, it doesn't strike me as I did. But uh, basically, let, let me... This is kind of where it was. You deal a lot with. I'll see if I can get to a spot. Did we go over these like the muscles of your claws doing that? No one, you did none of you recall that. I didn't go over shapes of muscles and things like that. Yeah, I at least do, I, I did never do the levers. Did I, didn't I do this with parallel fusiform? And, okay, so we didn't get into the muscles per se. It's, it's going to take, I don't want to spend a ton of time with this particular class. I don't do the leverage stuff. It's not that interesting to me. But, and it's entirely too confusing with these. But you should know the names and the actions of some of the muscles. And at least have an understanding of the groups. Because down the road, we're going to get to these. And it's, and it's something that's going to help you as you eventually, because one of the ways we, when we look at certain muscles that are affected, you can tell you regions, or sometimes you can tell you nerves that are involved. So there's a certain value to this, I think. So again, it's not an area I am terribly fond of doing. And there's, I would rather just function on the major muscles. And some of these illustrations are a little bit better than others. The larger they are, the easier they are to see. So the way we divide them is first we use muscles that are associated with the scalp and the face. So the, these head muscles are principally sort of globally classified as muscles of facial expression. They are all, to my knowledge, innervated by something called the facial nerve. When we get to the distribution of cranial nerves, that's a really big player. You're all going to see a condition that affects the facial nerve called, and you probably know somebody who's had it, called Bell's palsy. It's a very, very common condition a lot of things can cause it. I mean, you can get it right after just a routine virus. You know, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you got half the face is drooping. That's because that nerve has a variety of branches and and targets these areas. We'll, we do that toward the latter portion of, you know, to the very end. And we're not that, you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll probably get to that. So there's a number of muscles, and they give you all of this. You can see facial nerve, facial nerve, facial nerve. Sometimes I'll have a helper, you know, that's, I think, but principally it's facial nerve. So the illustrations are like that. For instance, to raise or lower your eyebrows, you have a lot of these gray areas that you see on illustrations and on the models. Have a, there are names that are called aponeuroses. They have nothing to do with the nervous system. And I don't know where the term came from. It's kind of like a hybrid of ligament dependent. And a lot of times muscles attach to that for mechanical advantage. So the frontalis and the occipitalis muscles make up this sort of collective muscle called the epicranius. So if you ever see somebody raising their eyebrows or lowering them or wrinkling them, that's where it comes from. From that facial nerve, closing your eye, so wrinkling your eyebrows, corrugator, because it's like a corrugated box, you know, and then supercilii, because that's the eyebrow. So the name tells you, orbicularis oculi, or for that matter, orbicularis oris, circular or sphincteric muscles when they fire they close or close down the opening all the same nerve that does that when you smile and, you, and and they'll have all sorts of illustrations showing you these they're kind of alarming with whoever models for them so there's quite a few of these and some are larger and more distinctive than others so as an overview just take a look at these for instance this platysma is rather large it's rather flat it's a sheet-like muscle, kind of covers this whole area. What does it do? It kind of covers up the other important stuff. So it's a layer of protection, if you want to think of it that way. This is the big player. It's, it, it really is a dividing muscle between, I and mean, it's almost like a pair of triangles, as you see when we look at the neck. The 
front triangle are muscles that are associated with speech and swallowing. The back, all of this mass of muscles has a lot to do with holding your head up and the head support, head and neck support. And this muscle that you can comes from the mastoid process down to the juncture of the sternum and the clavicle. And it's named for that. It's called sternoclido, which means clavicle mastoid. And you can see it when anybody does this. It's just, it's a very important dividing muscle. And you're going to see that and a very large muscle here called the trapezius are both innervated by something called the 11th cranial nerve. So you'll see that as well. And they're just showing you some of the actions. Just gets kind of scary looking. <laughs> no offense. You know, but I'm just saying, I wouldn't want to be one of those. They, they never want to be, I, I never would make it as a muscle model. I wouldn't want to do it. So your jaw, these muscles where some of them, for instance, you're going to see will have you pucker or purse your lips. They are not muscles of mastication. True chewing muscles, there's only four. And they are the temporalis, which you're going to see. It comes from here, the temporal area. And, and it comes all the way down and starts into that conoid process that's on the jaw that's on the mandible and the zygomatic arch down to the angle of the jaw and that ramus is called the masseter. Powerful chewers side to side are called the pterygoids. They go to those pterygoid plates. You might recall from the sphenoid bone. The buccinator is a facial muscle. It's like for pursing your lips or whistling, but what it does is it centers the food. The tongue helps as well just holds the food where it's supposed to be, but they're not truly muscles of mastication. The muscles of mastication, not the buccinator, by the way, are innervated by a very important nerve called the trigeminal nerve. Be aware of the trigeminal nerve. My wife suffers from a horrible condition called trigeminal neuralgia. She has to take medicine on a daily basis, multiple times a day. It ain't fun. So anytime you have a personal connection, Anytime you have an instructor or a professor who's got a personal connection in the area of interest, pay attention. Okay, they'll ask you questions about it. Word to the wise. Anything that says glosses is tongue. So, I mean, all of these swallowing, speaking, sticking out your tongue, whatever, whatever tongue motion this year would be. So, voila. See the buccinator facial nerve, at least they're correct over there. And here they are. Temporalis. Okay, down here, that conoid process, the masseter, and these are immense, powerful muscles. And again, these are just the sisters. Here are the pterygoids. They kind of go from those pterygoid processes here, lateral medial, and that side to side grinding, protracting, retracting your jaw, etc. And a bunch of tongue muscles. And they attach mostly the styloid process, the hyoid bone. That's where we see them. And they have some pretty good illustrations. I don't want to do all those animation things. It's not, it drives me crazy. Here's the sternocleidomastoid, dividing it into two triangles. And then the hyoid bone. And the hyoid is a bone that we really discuss with muscles. It, it, for whatever reason, a bone formed, and it doesn't attach to any other bones. So it's only got muscles attached to it. It's a very important bone forensically. If somebody's strangled, they always look for damage to the hyoid because inevitably it breaks or is damaged. So it's the kind of thing that pathologists look for if they're trying to examine close to that. That's it's very interesting. I'm watching a binge watching 24 seasons of a great show from England called Silent Witness, which is all about pathologists and stuff like that. Just love it. So it's, and it's very graphic. I mean, they. I mean, they're just having like real bodies that they're, they look like they, they must spend a lot of money on makeup. So the hyoid divides them into groups that are above and below and, and all the different things are here. To me, none of this is a big deal. I just want to give you some idea before we get into the big muscles. So you can see the ones above the floor, the oral cavity. I'm thinking pelican. You know, that big bird with the fish, like in the cartoons. It's like the pelican and the, I love the stork. 
I had cartoon references earlier today. I had Snagglepuss references and are you ready? Yogi Bear and Boo Boo. I love that. See, cartoons were, I love cartoons. And so now I, did, I watch them with my own kids 35, 40 years ago. My granddaughter is going to be 21, watched it with her, and now I've got another set of grandkids. We don't want to watch more any more cartoons. Shut up and sit down. So all of that is part of it. Play a role in swallowing and speaking. Variety of nerves that are there. Not a big deal for us at this point. Below, real strap-like muscles, swallowing and speaking. All have names, sternum to the hyoid. The thyroid is the thyroid cartilage. You, call, you and I pull out your Adam's apple. You learn about that in respiratory. So there's different ones that are there. These pharyngeal constrictors, they're the ones that are in the back. They surround the pharynx is basically the tube that becomes both your esophagus and your trachea. So it's a shared tube for respiratory and digestive. It's like a funnel that's kind of open in the front. And the back of the funnel is three layers of muscles. They're the principal powerful muscles when you swallow something. They're innervated by different nerves, typically it's, it's the vagus, and there's also something called glossopharyngeal. So here's just a view. There's the hyoid in the middle. All these different muscles that are there, sort of like the under area, because obviously it's open. And the muscles here. And as you can see, there's that very, very famous sternocleidomastoid. So you have a branch that goes to the sternum, and you have a branch that goes to the clavicle, as well as that. So it's a big, big muscle. Here are the constrictors. You can see them sort of surrounding superior, middle, and inferior. Buccinator over there. It's, there are so many names of muscles in the back, it's complicated. Collectively, all of the muscles that are there between the spinous process and the transverse processes of all of those vertebrae we tend to, we, because they hold your spine upright, the collective name for all these groups is the erector spinae. So it keeps the spine erect. There's a variety of different components. It's, it, again, if you were doing very advanced anatomy, medical school, anatomy, physical therapy school anatomy, that's when you get into this. Some of you, if you're going into a nursing field and you're working with an orthopedic or similar subspecialty that would get more information so you have a lot of these extending the trunk and main and maintain posture or head movements that are there and and we'll get into the innervation there's the sternocleidomastoid again and so you can see one of the ones like for instance these scalene muscles emanating from the ribs attaching to cervical vertebrae so you can imagine moving your head side to side or subtly rotating like that are there. The splenius, a much thicker, more powerful muscle. Again, most of its origin coming from, again, mostly around the spinous processes. So those are really, they're, they're, the bones are, are very strong anchor points. And here, this is what produces a lot of those little sort of ridges that you saw on the skull or on the models of skull. So here, here are, they call it like semi-spinalis. They're like little fingers of muscle that are in this area going up and they go to different areas. So you have a semi-spinalis capitis, and I'll just buzz through these. Iliocostalis, so they go from the ilium along the costal area, which means ribs. And you can see these longer, again, strap-like muscles. They all collectively overlap. So when someone has back spasms, which is a very frequent problem, uh, uh, particularly as you get older and arthritic or have disc problems or you do physical work. A lot of people get it. I mean, I haven't. I certainly don't do anything physical. Okay. It's just, it's hard to isolate it. You're almost treating the whole group of these as one. Again, I accidentally do that. So longissimus, very similar. So you can take a look at the two of them. Iliacostalis. And if you move along to longissimus, not a whole lot of difference between them. It looks like the same group of muscles. 
and the same with the spinalis muscles. So they're all very similar in location. And they're just showing you a bit more. The platysma, again, that was that sort of a sheet that covers the neck on either side. And, it, and it, again, it offers a certain amount of cover to vital structures. Here's a, just their representation of these different muscles that make up the erector spinae. And you have tiny muscles that in between the variety of vertebrae, these would be thoracic vertebrae. You can see obviously because the spine is process pointing down the way it does. So it's just, a, that's a little overview on that section. So I'm going to do a little bit of this each time and then demonstrate this. And that's what, what our day is about today. And let me go back. This is B, yay. B is for breathing. So there's not a whole lot to say about in between your ribs, you have muscles that are on the exterior called external intercostals and ones that are on the interior. The other and the big player in breathing is your diaphragm. Those are the players. When you inhale, it's the only time, unless you're blowing out the candles or taking a deep breath or exercising when you have to you know, do it more aggressively, the only time you're expending energy is to inhale. Everything else is sort of elastic, going back to normal. When you inhale, you fire your external intercostals that widens your chest and you flatten the diaphragm. What that does is it increases the volume of your thoracic cavity. The lungs expand and when and it's like a sealed chamber. It's the whole idea of the relationship of pressure and volume. There's something you may or may not learn about called the ideal gas law. Is it ringing a bell? Okay, it means that pressure and volume have a constant relationship. So in a closed chamber, if you increase the volume, you decrease the pressure and vice versa. So when you expand, you increase the volume, it lowers the pressure, volume up, pressure down, and that basically creates a pressure gradient. It's like a concentration gradient, more oxygen on the outside, the inside, in it goes. And you reverse it when you exhale, carbon dioxide goes out. So that's really what this is about. So the, the so you're going to see the inspiratory or inhaling muscles, the diaphragm and the external intercostals. They're the big players. Expiration, you just relax them. And it goes back, assuming everything is normal. It all changes as people get older, if they have respiratory problems, if they're an idiot like me, for 40 years smoking two packs a day and you thought I was Sprite. Asshole. The reason I'm here teaching you is the lady I am married to who threatened me with bodily harm and I, if I didn't stop smoking. The way that Two people who are romantically engaged. I will kill you if you don't, you know, you get the idea. So that's all really that happens. And you can see there's nerves that come directly from the spinal cord that we will look at when we look at nerves, either in this term or you may look at with somebody else next term, intercostal nerves that are there. There's the diaphragm is fascinating, a big dome shaped muscle. So when it fires, it goes from dome to flatten. Really important. Muscles are barriers. That's the beauty of muscles. Muscles separate regions. When something can cross over a barrier, it's really a problem. The distinction between, and you'll hear about it, if someone has cancer, stage one means it's isolated in the area where it starts. Stage two means it moves to a lymph node which means it has the potential of spreading. Stage three, it moved to another organ on the same side of the diaphragm. Stage four, bad prognosis, means that it spread across the diaphragm. So once it crosses a barrier like that, big trouble. There aren't a lot of people who live long after those kinds of diagnoses, or at least not with unaltered. There are three openings in the diaphragm, one for the vena cava, okay, one for the esophagus, and one for the aorta. And they're sealed because those large structures are in there. So it's not like there's space creating a vacuum or, you know, or unsealing the cavity that are there. 
so you can see some of the muscles that they're showing you, intercostals, etc. The abs, very noticeable, particularly in people who are very highly conditioned. When you hear about somebody having the quote six pack, and it really looks more like eight to me than six, then muscles are called rectus, which means straight abdominis. They are attached to one of those aponeuroses. Okay, a band of might be ligament, might be tendon type material that they adhere to. Okay, and you'll see them. Then you have muscles that come down this way at an angle, they're called obliques. You have ones that are on the outside and ones that go the other way inside of it called internal obliques. And you have one that's like a big white belt that's very, very deep, okay, called the transverse abdominis. Four sets, because you have one on the right, one left. So there again, they run at angles to one another, provide added strength. You don't have a lot of support. So that's why when someone has back problems, it's pretty hard to the end of what do they do? They do a series of modified crunches. They do abdominal exercises to strengthen that. And that then you can have this muscle and have the spine in the back trying to hold everything together. That's the idea behind it. So they do a lot of things, flexion, rotation, all associated with all of these bodily functions that are there. So you have, and, and again, a lot of intercostal nerves. And you'll see, it's easier to see it. For instance, there are the sections of the rectus abdominis. You don't generally notice this because it's kind of, you know, below the belt line. So you see that. Okay. Just my favorite soccer player always takes off his shirt. If at all humanly possible, like any other and he's, and he's getting older now. He's 37. Cristiano Ronaldo. Okay. You've seen Cristiano. Yeah. I, I wanted to look like that. Not happening. I, 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 he must have like zero body fat. Yeah, I was watching him when he was like an 18 year old kid and he came over from Portugal sporting a Portugal to Manchester United. I'm a Man United supporter. So the, the name of this is white. It appears called the linea alba, which means white line. And it's a really important landmark. That tissue substantially goes from here, the xiphoid process, to and below the umbilicus. And so because there's no muscle there, okay, here's what we do. When someone has to do abdominal surgery, that's where you make the cut. You want to expose somebody for uh, gastro, uh, removing a gastric ulcer, part of the stomach, intestinal surgery, whatever. You make the cut from here to here. If, it ha if, if you need more exposure, you go a little bit lower. Okay. How do I know this? I've got a very big scar in that area of surgeries that I have. You use that so it's natural. It's big, thick tissue. You sew it together, it heals like that. Now you can see some of the fibers, that's the rectus abdominis and the obliques, the external oblique, is like from outside downward toward the midline and the internal, it's like from the outside going up toward the midline. So they're at right angles and the transverse is deep to all of it. Again, like a big, big waistband, thick belt that's kind of high. Might be the way to look. So here you can see it now. So here you can see the transverses. Here you can see the rectus, the external oblique, and like I said, running kind of in the opposite direction of those fibers. Up here to here, deep to the internal oblique. Let me show you the layers. And here they're just showing you externals, externals lower, oops, transverses running around. I don't do all of these. There's a lot of elaborate muscles from the sacral area of the nervous system when we get to that okay these are kind of what they call the outlet of the pelvis there's i mean if you go back and look at the pelvic bones there's no bottom okay it's there it's all soft tissue so we call it the pelvic floor that's an interesting area more so in women than in men because of childbirth and it and it will weaken over time from childbirth uh from hereditary problems a variety of problems if you happen to work down at McGee or go there for some training here locally, a wonderful 
uh, women's medical facility for UPMC McGee uh, down in Oakland. And it, they have a whole unit that's dedicated to pelvic floor, pelvic floor restoration and pelvic floor surgery. Uh, my mother-in-law had surgery there on that particular issue. My mom back in New Jersey had a surgery for that. And these are mostly, they, they occur when you're probably set of pushing 70 and above. That type of thing. And they'll show you some of the innervation. Not a big deal for us. This is all, I mean, there's an elaborate muscular structure. And you can see we're looking at the female because it's a much more common problem, let's say, than in the male even though they might show you the mail as well. Okay. And here you're getting a better, this would be, again, you're getting maybe a slightly different view. It's there. So there's a number of muscles. And I don't really go into this. I didn't want to show them to you. Here we have the male and the muscular. So there's, there's, it can be very, very elaborate. And again, for people who go into these areas specifically, you learn more about them. And this brings us to, and the way we classify them, muscles of the anterior and posterior thorax, chest muscles that play a role in shoulder and arm activity. So they are mostly extrinsic shoulder muscles combining to hold the shoulder that's a fixator, the scapula, and arm motions, all the variety of them. And they're both anterior and posterior, you'll see famously. Now, you saw a little bit of this before. If you go back, you're going to see what looks like a serrated edge. So it's kind of, you see it sort of in the under, and it's another one. If you see somebody who works out, you'll see those finger-like muscles. They're called the serratus anterior. There's one in the back as well. Okay. Here's the very large pectoralis major. That's the breast sits upon that. The deltoid externally even though most of its origin comes from the posterior aspect of the spine of the scapula, the massive biceps brachii, and there's a muscle called brachialis underneath it, and there's sternocleidomastoid, yet again, playing a big role. If you take away, if you dissect that away, you have a smaller version of that called pectoralis minor, which has these little straps. And this kind of covers it over. This is a major muscle that's there. And again, this, then you can start to see that subscapularis from the subscapular fossa that we talked about in the scapula. That's part of the root. That's the interior portion of the rotator cuff. Hard to see from that. So that's what I mean. This is, so you can see here. Here you can see the, see if I can move it forward. Pectoralis minor, even though it's more like smaller portions covered by the major, much larger. Here's the serratus anterior. Again, helping to secure the scapula, but coming from the ribs. So you see those finger-like projections that are there. Posteriorly, again, this is more head, neck, shoulder stabilization. Massive muscle. There, there's another, more of this aponeurotic tissue called I mean, when it's up here, it's called the ligamentum nuci. Down here, I just think they refer to it generically as aponeurosis. This looks like a triangle or a trapeze. So they call it a trapezius. Okay. Here's the delta, which is which is very, very large and thick. One of the sites for injection that's very, very commonly used. The, the pectoralis major brings your arm forward. It starts from here to here. What complements it in the back is this. It's called latissimus dorsi. So it's dorsal. It's on the back. And they work opposite. So it, and if you're fond of watching the Olympics, like a lot of people are, look at the swimmers. They really, you see wonderful definition of muscles that are there. Particularly if they do a lot of like distance freestylers, that's where they you really see definition in the pectoralis and the latissimus area. Now you can begin to see other muscles that are there. And if you go to the gym, you work on these kinds of things that are there. Here's teres major, and there's a little slip teres minor. Why that's rotator cuff is up in the head. Here's infraspinatus and supraspinatus. Again, know the four muscles. Infraspinatus, supraspinatus, subscapularis, 
teres minor, the four muscles that make up the rotator cuff. Teres major is bigger, but it inserts into the, the humerus rather than at the shaft, not the head. And these are called rhomboids. So you go to the gym and they have an apparatus, they'll show you, you do this and you know, it increases activity on the rhomboids or the lats or whatever it is. Levator scapula, I didn't touch on that. And again, it's more of a stabilizer. It's like, it's almost like pulling up if you're moving your head, it's kind of pulling up and, and, and making an impact on the scapula. And they're showing you all of those. Maybe one more section and we'll do the technology. See. So here they're showing, this is just more of the explanation. Pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, deltoid. Those are the prime movers. They have the most impact. Powerful muscles, no question about it. Four muscles of the cup. These are helpers. Teres major, coracal brachialis. Again, some good looks at those. When you die, or physicians, when they, it's interesting. And we had a couple of our students who were at Lecom, that's Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, at Seton Hill. A couple of uh, gals who came back, one's in her second, one's in her first year from our school. And it's interesting, they don't even have a cadaver there. Nowadays, they're doing a lot of this is done the way we do it and with certain degrees of advancement. I, I have to talk with the folks at nursing, and I think you're probably going to have even a more advanced technology up in that rise, for those in nursing, in that rise center. But there's quite a bit of stuff going on there. They, they, that's really uh, a very impressive area. Just for, just for the sake of completeness. So you'll be able to see a lot of that stuff. Here they are once again. So here you can see muscles that are here. So again, this is, it, it's sort of, it's hard to see. Okay. Here's the biceps brachii, that very large muscle that we talked about before. Underneath it is another massive muscle, more medially placed brachialis. It really, they both contribute. To when you flex your arm in that way, you're going to see there's some overlap on the exterior of the posterior muscles, which are called the triceps. We'll see more of that as it moves along. And again, they're just showing you, and if you find the illustrations useful, great. That's all the rotator cuff. That's not part, but you can see where the insertion is here versus here. This is impacting the head, hence it secures it as opposed to this, which is not. And there, again, so now you're looking at the back portion. This is the latissimus dorsi, inserting post, from the posterior aspect in to the humerus shaft, the upper portion of the shaft. This is triceps. Triceps means three heads, although you only can see two of them here. Maybe they'll have a cutaway better. They insert all by a common tendon, that's that grayish area, that inserts into that very significant structure, the olecranon process on the posterior aspect of the ulna. So if you, I mean, you're gonna feel that lateral head out here is quite large, okay, that's there. And the long head is quite large and that goes all the way up again into the scapular area. So, and there's another medial head that's not quite as distinctive. And perhaps they will show it to you. Anteriorly, this is the member we looked at. The long head of the biceps, securing it going over that into a tubercle in the glenoid. And the short head into that coracoid process. And then underneath it, so to speak, working along with the coracobrachialis, another from the coracoid process along the side, you have the brachialis. So they're both big, big muscles. And they're showing him you again. Get a lot of the same pictures, it looks like. And then we take a look at muscles that are anterior and posterior. We saw that illustration before. Here's the triceps. Again, you can see 
so you're you're having portions that insert laterally into the humerus, portions that are a little bit larger or longer into the scapula, and again, most of its insertion into that uh, olecranon process. And down the road, you get kind of to the innervation. Here. And they're just showing you more of those muscle pictures. That's more or less what's here. And then lastly, when we start to get into this area, and there's a lot, I just want to go over them with you a little bit. There are muscles here, as you can see, from the humerus going into the radius. When you pronate, you do this. I beg your pardon. When you supinate, you do this. When you pronate, you do that. So you have pronators and, and supinator muscles that furnish that motion. You have four mu you have four muscles that make up part of the equipment here at the bend of your wrist. That's called the, that. They each have a little compartment. There's a band of fascia, it's connective tissue that covers it, famously called the carpal tunnel. There's little passageways for these structures. You have flexor carpi radialis. You have palmaris longus, so you can do this. Flexor digitorum, so you can do that. Flexor carpi ulnaris, so you can do that. You can, when you do that, you can almost see those, or and you certainly can feel them. In between palmaris longus, which is this, flexor digitorum, which is that, you have an area where you have the median nerve, which is the big nerve that supplies almost all of the flexor areas in your wrist and your hand. That's the nerve that's trapped by carpal tunnel. A lot of people get carpal tunnel. Okay. I mean, I have little signs of it when I tap like this. You can feel like little needles and pins projecting from it. I mean, that's and, and without it having to be painful or causing weakness, as it progresses, it goes to those areas. So you have, and there's, so there's several muscles that are part of that. Here's the ulnaris. So they're, they're big muscles. The flexors are big muscles in that area. Flexor digitorum, again. And you'll notice, and this is true with the foot, that you have a group of mostly you have, when it says flexor digitorum, it's basically supplying fingers two through five. The thumb's got its own set. Love that. Captain of the fingers. Flexor pollicis longer, extensor, okay, opponents. So I love that. Big toe is the same thing. Captain of the toes. There was a TV show that made that famous called Seinfeld from the absolute wild mind of a guy named Larry David. So here they are. There's the retinaculum that covers the tunnel. Here are the members that you begin to see there. So flexor carpi ulnaris, palmaris longus, flexor carpi radialis. Underneath that, you have the flexor digitorum that's there. This is the flexor retinaculum. You have banks of muscles toward the thumb called thanar, one, two, and it's the way it's kind of divided. Your pinky, hypothanar, there's a muscle mass here with a variety of muscles and thanar eminence that's at the base of the thumb. And so and all of them have a certain degree of relevance that are there. And again, I don't go into all of these for long. You have a retinacula that binds extensor tendons as well. And you'll see extensor carpi radialis, one that's short, brevis, extensor digitorum, extensor carpi ulnaris. The flexors all insert into that medial epicondyle. That's where you can feel it because your finger is on the epicondyle and flex. The extensors, the lateral epicondyle will be able to. So that's why that medial one is so much bigger. So when you hear about tennis elbow, that's what it is. It's epicondylitis, it's the irritation of those tendons that all insert in and around that area. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to this. And for anybody who's interested in going into sport or rehabilitation or physical therapy, that kind of occupational therapy, that's where all of that comes from. Probably enough for the fingers. And I'll save the, 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 the lower extremity stuff for another time.
this is called cross-sectional anatomy. Uh, for instance, we do it by areas. We do the bones, we do the muscles, we do systemic anatomy. Cross-sectional is something that you learn. There's a lot of folks over in the nursing that, that are uh, nuclear medicine majors. They have a whole other major that's part, that was originally part of nursing until they sort of married nursing with the other departments that it's part of. So they, you learn cross-sectional anatomy. So here you are in the arm, you know about the biceps, you know about here's the biceps, the brachialis, the different heads and the triceps, where the blood vessels are. Those are all things you learn about a lot in med medical school. It's, a, it's almost like they'll give you a cross, they'll give you something like that. You have to tell them where the cross section's from, very specifically. Is it mid shaft of the radius? Is it distal? Is it proximal? Because that's why you have to understand things. You got to kind of know what's there that you might encounter. And then so the, and, and there's a lot, a lot of small muscles in the hand itself. So all of these activities that are there. This is kind of neat. Okay. Now I'll see if I can get it for you. So these are, and, and the foot has very, very similar muscles. I kind of skipped over it or I missed it more likely. It's an extensor. I don't know why they don't have it there. Oh. Such is life. In here, if you're skinny, you can do that kind of a thing. You see a little pocket? I could just make it if I really accentuate it. It's like there is an extensor pollicis longus and brevis. They both, it's like hitchhiking. It's gone. That little indentation's got a great name. It's called the anatomical snuff box. When you say snuff today, it's those little packets of tobacco that, that are horrible, that give people all sorts of mouth cancers. You know, that, that were very, very popular years ago. And they had chewing tobacco. In the old, when tobacco came from the New World to Europe, it was, they basically made a powder out of it and you did, and you took it, inhaled it, called snuff. And you actually got a, a quicker buzz of the nicotine with that inhale, as opposed to smoking it. It was just, it was the way they originally, the original, the, the, it's funny, the natives in the New World smoked it. And then when it came to the old world, to Europe, they started to doing more of the snuff with it. Funny. It's a history thing. You should be interested. Okay, I'll show you what, I, I don't have to record this part. I'm going to demonstrate it and we'll make a recording and, I'll, and it's, yeah. I tend to do an AP2. This is more for demo purposes than anything else.